Welcome to Broadcasting Common Ground, the Deep Foundation Institute's podcast channel. In this series, Morgan's Mentors, Morgan Neesmith will be talking with industry representatives about career challenges, mentor and mentee advice. In this episode, Helen Robertson shares her industry experience, including how to get started and how to get the most out of your activity. All right, welcome to DFI's podcast channel, Broadcasting Common Ground. I am Morgan Neesmith, and it is time once again to move the needle with our podcast on mentorship and the geotechnical industry as a whole. Today, not only are we going to talk about engineering, but we're going to dive into getting involved in the industry as a whole and what the demands and rewards of that can be. To that end, there is not a better guest than we could have than the award-winning Senior Project Manager from GEI Consultants, Helen Robinson. Now, Helen is not just a member of numerous professional organizations, but has served as the Executive Editor of Deep Foundations Magazine. She was the inaugural chair of the DFI Women at Deep Foundations Committee, currently serves on the board of the DFI Educational Trust, and most recently also serves on the board of governors of the ASCE Geo Institute. So Helen, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Morgan. I'm so happy to be here. We appreciate you taking the time. And now I've known you for quite some time, but for our audience, particularly our younger listeners who don't uh, know you quite as well, could you tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from, and just kind of go through your uh, professional history and how you've ended up at, at GEI? Sure, thanks. So I grew up in the Philadelphia area. Um, I attended Penn State University for my undergrad, and I loved it. I was very active and involved uh, both in the engineering community there, Chi Epsilon, but also in a service fraternity that was uh, involved in, you know, uh, cleaning up the campus and volunteering to visit it, visit nursing homes and things like that. And I, I loved my experience there. I loved the football games and the camaraderie. So I decided to stay for my master's. Um, at Penn State as well. Um, And during that time, I had some internships, summer internships in the industry, which were extremely helpful in in helping frame my education and helping me to understand what was involved in geotechnical engineering, getting really interested in it. And so that was all a great experience. When I graduated uh, with my master's, I started at Urban Engineers in Philadelphia, and I worked for the bridge department And I found that I I wasn't that engaged or interested in doing some of the structural uh, design. I felt like some of the, it was very code driven and it wasn't always um, exciting. And so after a short time, uh, I started with Schnabel Engineering. I was there for 14 years and had a fantastic time, got to work on a lot of high-end projects uh, the Jefferson Memorial Seawall in Washington, D.C., the Ellis Island Seawalls in New York Harbor, um, just a host of exciting and interesting projects. And that's where I really fell in love with doing contractor support work, helping to solve problems, coming up with value engineering options. Um, and I've been with GEI for five years, and I've been able to continue that as well. And GEI has given me the opportunity to be a leader, a branch manager here for the Exton office in Pennsylvania, and to cultivate a group of geostructural engineers, do some recruiting, retaining, and it's been a great experience. That's awesome. Uh, I did not know. It sounds like your involvement in what maybe some people might call extracurricular activities goes back even to your college years. That's great. It ties in very nicely with what we want to talk about today, and that's involvement in these professional organizations. Can you talk about at what point in that journey that you really started to get involved in the different organizations that you're a part of and why at that time as a younger engineer you thought it was important? Sure. Yeah, I'd say it was right from the beginning. Um, I'd always been interested in history and writing, and when I had the opportunity to uh, write a paper on the Ellis Island seawalls for the Ports and Harbors con- Conference. Uh, you know, I thought, I'm going to do this. I spent a couple weeks putting together a paper and, and writing and working hard on it. And uh, I gave it to my supervisor, who was Jesus Gomez, who you also know, Morgan. And, you know, he he redlined it a lot and maybe kept five or six of my words that I had originally 
come up with, but it was a great experience. He taught me to write technically and go to conferences. Um, he was my first mentor who introduced me to people, got me involved in the industry, said, just volunteer for things, go to the committees. You don't have to know anything, volunteer. And, and that's what I did. So that was kind of how I first started getting involved in DFI, in the ADSC, in the ASCE, those types of organizations. And I'm glad you mentioned Jesus because our next question is, did you have any uh, mentors both uh, within organizations that you're working for, which obviously you talked about, but also once you got into those organizations, were, were there people um, that were also sort of mentors in terms of how to uh, interact in these organizations and then how to get more involved as you started to be involved in the, the uh, organizations and how did those relationships develop? Sure. Yeah, I used to think that a mentor was one person that you had a very specific relationship with and you would ask them, will you be my mentor? And they would guide you like a beacon through right. your career and show you the way and tell you, you know, what you should be doing and offer advice. And that's not the case at all. I, I think mentors should come from both, you, you know, you're in your profession and outside from the firm that you work for and other firms, they should be both male and female, older and younger than you. I mean, I think the more diversity you can get in your mentors, the more perspectives you're going to have. And, you know, when you have that light bulb moment, why didn't I think of solving a problem that way? I mean, that, that can only increase the more people you talk to. I really think the only requirements are that it be a voluntary relationship. I'm not a fan of the assigned mentor. I feel like it doesn't work that well. It's not natural. Um, and the other thing is that they, they could be your friend, but that they can deliver some criticism to you and that you can, some constructive criticism that you can learn from, and they're not afraid to hurt your feelings. So I think that's really important that you get that honest feedback and people say, you need to get out of your comfort zone and lead this meeting, or you need to talk less and listen more, whatever the case may be. Then you take that feedback to heart and, you know, try to improve, even though that's always challenging, right? No, and I'm glad you, you mentioned, especially the part about mentors being uh, sometimes even younger than you. I, I've gotten a lot out of the mentor groups that we have with the Women in Deep Foundation, a surprising not, uh, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but talking to people across a wide variety of experience uh, and uh, age ranges has been very, very rewarding. Um, so I'm glad I you agree. mentioned that. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. I, I was not, I, I want to say I was a little bit skeptical about the idea. I didn't think that a group of five or six people meeting together and talking together about their issues was going to be effective. And it is actually incredible. I'm having a great experience in pod five and, you know, it's <laughs> pod five forever. Shout out to pod five. <laughs> it has been great. Every week we come every month when we meet, even if we have a topic planned, uh, Abira Batul is our leader. Even if there's a topic planned, very often it'll turn into just who needs to talk, who is having an issue that month or who needs to get something out and vent it. And then we all kind of uh, give our advice and it has been great, a really great experience. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, when we talk a little more about the, the uh, industry groups and how you got involved there as well, um, there's, it's one thing to, to be a member of an organization and to attend the conferences, um, but at a certain point, you clearly made the decision to get more involved in that. Do you remember sort of the first time you really took a more of a leading role uh, in maybe a particular assignment within a committee or as a committee leader? And how did that come about? And what was that experience like in, in terms of shaping uh, your sort of view on, on the participation in these committees? Yeah, I, I would say it it started off in the Micropile Committee. That was a, a committee that um, I had a lot of interest in because of the types of elements. And I remember 
Mary Ellen Large was putting together the ISM conference, the International Society for Micropiles conference in Washington, D.C., and she asked if I would help, like as an intern, help her get organized, and it was a great experience. I felt like I was contributing something, and then to have this group of international people coming together uh, in a constructive format to learn and grow, I was hooked then and was very excited to, to be part of that. And then I guess the other one, of course, is the Women in Deep Foundations Committee. Um, when that, when we had the interest group and we talked about what it was going to be, and then I was selected as chair, and we were planning our first event. We were planning a networking event at one of the DFI annual conferences, and I was so nervous. Like, would anybody come, and and what would it be like? And, and it was a fantastic success. We had more people than we could handle. Everybody was meeting, talking. We had an icebreaker. I got to get up and talk in front of everyone. And I I was just so thrilled to be giving back to the industry and to be, you know, doing something new. Cool. And if I was a younger engineer, so pretend hard that I was (laughs) a young engineer and I'm looking at all of this involvement that you've had and I say, but Helen, what is it? why should I get involved with a professional organization and what are the sort of things that I should be doing once I'm involved in the organization that could help me be a little bit more successful? What what sort of advice would you give them? I guess the first thing is it's really fun. It's fun to come outside your cube and meet other people with like interests and realize that there's more beyond just the project that you've been working on for a couple of months to hear about how other people are using different technolo- technologies or innovative solutions. It's, it's exciting to be around other people with common interests, I think. So it's fun. Um, I do feel like it's important to give back to our profession. You know, we're already a profession of serving people, uh, building things and keeping people safe. And, and here's another way to become a leader, to, you know, gather more interest for our profession, which never gets enough credit. You never see what we do, right? It's always under the ground and it's very hard to get people interested in it and excited about it, or even to know that it exists. So I think anything that we can do to give back is beneficial. Um, And sometimes it's nice to have an assignment outside, you know, the spreadsheets that you're working on, the design that you're working on. It's cool to have a a side assignment to, to delve into. I like the way you put a lot of that. And one of the things I've liked about having these conversations is sometimes people will say things that I believe in in, in as well, but they, they put them in a much more succinct uh, manner than I could ever put them. And and I think you've touched on all the reasons that being in these committee or being in these organizations are so rewarding. Um, now, one thing as you're as a younger engineer say is joining these organizations. Again, we get to the point where, all right, you're a part of the organization. You're in your first uh, conference or your second conference, um, and they decide, I really am interested in this. How would would you recommend? Uh, even though these organizations do, I think, have some obligation to engage their younger members how are the younger members going to get the most out of being uh, parts of these organizations as they start to get involved and want to get involved more? Yeah, Um, I think first, especially in DFI, you can start out in the committees, in the technical committees. And when you go into the room, don't sit at the edges, come sit at the table. Everyone's invited to sit at the table. There's no status there. It, we want everybody to come and listen and participate. And I guess my advice is to volunteer, but in an active way, not just say, I'm here to help with whatever needs to be done. That's great. But even better, if you can say, I noticed that this needs to be done, I can, I can lead a group or I can, uh, with some help, I can take over this task and I'd be happy to get it done, and here's how I'm going to do it. I think that is so powerful, um, and and it would be great if we could have young people volunteering to do things like that and, and stepping up and, you know, not on their own. There would certainly be a lot of guidance, but sometimes it, it takes someone 
to, to drive the train. And I think that's where a young person could, could step up and volunteer. One of the, uh, I don't want to end these organizations as extra or uh, additional work. And, and what I was hoping you could talk about is how has this service extensive as it is helped you personally grow and expand? Because I think that might uh, lend itself well to some of these younger engineers as to what they're going to get out of this beyond just, you know, hey, it might be nice to hang out with some people. Over the course of your career, how has this uh, service uh, helped you personally grow? Yeah, um, it's helped me grow, um, I think, certainly to meet people, to network. Um, the, the people who are involved in DFI and in the technical committees come from all different backgrounds, right? Engineers and contractors, manufacturers and suppliers, academia, everybody's coming together. And so you start to develop relationships and that that's going to lead to work in the future. I mean, I think that's going to lead to partnerships. Hey, we have a good time together. We volunteer together in this. We're in the same mentoring pod. I need an engineer to design these foundations, or I need a contractor to take a look at this. I have a problem here. I mean, that's exactly what the next step is. And, you know, I think sometimes young people think that is very far in the in the distance, but it all starts with building relationships and getting to know people. And um, you know, when you're looking for a certain tooling that's going to get through a formation, a rock formation, and you can walk through an exhibit hall full of different products, and you can talk to the manufacturers. I mean, you are certainly furthering your knowledge and furthering the profession to try different things. So I think. You know, that has brought a lot of value to me, um, as well as, you know, certainly making friends. I, I didn't expect that so many of my very close friends would be in the industry working for competitors. You know, it's uh, especially in DFI is very much like a family and it's very, um, you know, very nice to, to have those types of relationships. It can be difficult sometimes to remember that you're not really supposed to like that person all that much, but, <laughs> right. but, but they're so much fun to, to be around and you get a lot out of them. Okay, it is time for us to take a very brief break and then we will be back to wrap up with Helen Robinson. Hello, listeners. I'm Teresa Angler, Executive Director of the Deep Foundations Institute. And wow, so many great nuggets of information in the discussion today on Morgan's Mentors. Hope you found them useful. If you're a student or young professional, I want to specifically speak to you about getting involved with DFI so you can connect and interact with these experienced professionals and learn even more from them and their colleagues. DFI provides free membership for students and that membership allows you to join one of our many technical committees, attend events at a very low fee or no fee at all, and also access valuable technical resources such as free downloadable papers and manuals, our journal and magazine at DFI.org, as well as other technical documents from the geotechnical mining and tunneling world at OneMind.org. For young professionals, an individual membership is very affordable, and if your company is a corporate member of DFI, they may be able to include you under their annual dues, so ask your supervisor. Other activities you may be interested in are, are our annual paper competitions for students and young professors. These provide each winner with a $1,000 travel stipend, free registration to DFI's annual conference, two nights of lodging, a presentation spot during the conference, and the opportunity to have the paper published in the DFI journal. We also offer scholarships and Women in Deep Foundations professional development grants through our charitable arm, the DFI Educational Trust. To date, we've provided over $1.6 million to over 450 students and professionals. Why not be one of them and apply? Information on all these programs, resources, and activities can be viewed at DFI.org. We look forward to welcoming you, and if you have any questions, shoot an email to staff at dfi.org. Now, back to Morgan and his guest mentor. Okay, we want to thank Helen Robertson again for joining us today. 
But before we go on to our last question, Helen, do you have any last thoughts you might like to share about what a mentor looks like? I think we've already talked about the idea that a mentor is not a singular person. Um, I know a lot of people, myself included, came out, came out of college thinking and looking for one person, your mentor. And I think that's a misconception, a common misconception. And there isn't going to be someone who can step you through and give you feedback throughout your entire career, but there's many people who can offer feedback on different things. So I would encourage you to talk to as many people as you can and build those relationships and make sure that you listen for that feedback from, from all of your mentors. Outstanding. I think that's fantastic advice for uh, our student uh, members and our young engineers. So on to the last question that we ask everyone that joins us. If you could interview any one person, living or not, for this podcast, who would that be and why? Well, Morgan, I'm going to show my nerdy side, and my answer is going to be Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek. Nice. I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I love the way that he created, uh, in the future, a diverse group of people with all kinds of talents and abilities or disabilities working together for a common goal. And I think it really it shows a very bright outlook for the future. And I'd love to hear what he would say about mentoring. That is a really interesting answer. He was so subtle about sliding in a lot of social commentary into, uh, into his shows. Great answer. All right. Fantastic. Helen, I want to thank you again. We appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us. And for all of you out there listening, we also appreciate you taking the time to listen. And we hope you look forward to joining us again for future episodes as we talk to more of Morgan's mentors. And until then, remember, the truth will send a ripple through your body. On behalf of DFI, we hope you enjoyed this episode. The views information and opinions expressed during Deep Foundation Institute's podcasts are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of DFI. DFI does not verify or take responsibility for the accuracy of the information contained, nor does it warrant that the information contained herein is suitable for any general or specific use. The podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. Editing, modification, or redistribution of this podcast is prohibited. Proudly sponsored by Dan Brown and Associates. Thanks for your time. Keep on surviving.